hopefully most of you have um, made some decent ground in putting your component graphs on there. This is just a simple sum, so I don't need to flip any of them upside down and add the negative or anything like that. But the shapes are a lot more interesting, so it becomes a little trickier to think about this. Now, again, I'm going to start this one the way I started that one, which is to look at the easy bits first. Look at the parts of the graph where you don't have to have any graph, right? On this, when you have a look at the two components, there is clearly a discontinuity. Where is it? It's at x equals 0, okay? Now, discontinuous, I got asked a great question before about, oh, do I need an open circle, okay? Uh, you could put an open circle on there if you wanted, but when you have a look at y equals 1 on x, it has no open circle. Why is that? Because instead of an open circle, we would put an asymptote there, right? The places where you put open circles would be if you were graphing something like this. Y equals x squared on x. Now, I think we, our brain sort of triggers, oh, I better simplify that, and so you just out pops y equals x in your brain, right? But this is not y equals x because there's a discontinuity. Do you see that, right? So because it can't exist at zero, when I draw this, I would say almost everywhere, this thing looks like y equals x, like all the way off that way and all the way off that way, except at that one particular point where I get the denominators being zero, right? So that's where you get a hollow circle, because you're like, oh, I'm passing through here. It looks like I should be passing through, but hey, actually, you're not, okay? That's what the hollow circle indicates. In this case, no hollow circle required, because no one in their right mind thinks, oh, I'm not here. Like, the asymptote tells you where you're going, okay? All right, so I've got that just filed in my mind. What else can I conclude from this graph? And how will I do it? Any suggestions? Hmm. Yeah. The way the two graphs touch. Yeah. So one of the obvious things that we look for, because they're easy to work with, is points of intersection. Now, I've drawn this. I've done the best with my scale that I could. That point of intersection, actually, because of the simplicity of these graphs, you should be able to just look at and see. What's the point of intersection? It's 1, 1, isn't it, right? Because x equals 1, well, you square it, you still get 1. You take the reciprocal, you still get 1. So therefore, at x equals 1, the whole graph is going to be y equals 2. I've added those ordinates, so it should be twice as high, right? Now, that was a spot on the right-hand side where they sort of equaled each other, so they jumped up. There's a sort of equal and opposite side on the uh, feature on the left over here. Can you see? One of these is always negative. One is always positive. So that means there's some point where the negativeness of this is exactly equal to the positiveness of this. Where is it? At x equals negative 1. Because you square it, you get 1. And you take the reciprocal, you get negative 1. So when you have a look, I guess based on the scale that I've used, it'll be something like that. And you can actually, if you draw yours like really awesome to scale, you can literally just measure. And sometimes you have no choice because you don't have enough other information. Okay, that's good. We've got some important points. What else can I do here to help get a shape? Any suggestions? Okay. Um, well, on the right side, it's easy to look at because it's all positive. So okay, fantastic. Above, but great. Yeah, great idea. So addition of ordinates, if you're adding two positive things together, they're going to get bigger, aren't they? Right? So whatever the real graph is over here, it's going to be above both of these all the time. Does that make sense? So I'm going to get this shape up here, and I'm going to get this shape up here. Okay, does that make sense? And you can see, uh, over here on the left, if you want to imagine it this way, you've got the hyperbola, right? That's kind of like the thing that's taking over. And then you're adding these little bits from the parabola, so that's why you're getting closer and closer and closer. Does that make sense? But then when you go in the opposite direction, you're actually... Um, having the parabola take over, and you're adding little, little bits from the hyperbola. Do you see that? Okay, so that looks good so far. There's actually a problem with it, but we'll find out what that is in a second. Generally, it's pretty good. What about over here? What's happening for x is less than zero? Okay, so over here, it depends on what, where you're starting, I suppose. Um, if we want to start negative, I, I'm going to look in here. See this spot here? To the right, over here, uh, this guy is positive, but it's not very positive, is it? It's like little positive. Whereas this guy is negative, and it's super, it's massively negative, right? So if you're thinking that tug of war again, this guy's winning, okay? So therefore, I'm going to get a, a curve down here, 
like that. And it's important that you notice I'm getting closer and closer to the hyperbola. Why is that? Why am I getting closer? Mm, because the thing I'm adding to the hyperbola is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So this value is the gap down here. Okay? What happens when I go further that way? Yeah, I'm going to approach this guy because the hyperbola is getting tired and moves up. So therefore, the concavity actually changes. Do you see that? Concave up, concave down. So you actually have a point of inflection somewhere in there. Okay, now we're pretty much done, except I mentioned before that there's actually a problem with my graph. Remember, I said here, hey, stationary point, okay? There's a stationary point here too, and you can actually find out what it is. How do I find out what a stationary point is? You just differentiate. We've, we've done this to death in the Tina course, right? So there's the function, okay? Let me just write it in a way that makes it easier to differentiate. Oops, it's a plus. Okay, so if I find the first derivative, what would you like me to write? 2x minus x to the power of negative Good. Yeah, that, that is the derivative. Okay, uh, I guess I can write that a little bit neater. Okay, cool. So why was I doing that for again? I'm looking for a stationary point. And um, by the way, just this is um, take off my extension two hat, put on my two unit and extension one hat, because I see this all the time. Please don't just say on the next line, like, oh, let's just make it zero. Like, it is equal to zero sometimes, or well, actually, specifically, one time, but not always, right? This is a general statement of the derivative everywhere. That's the whole awesome thing about differentiation. And if you want to say, I'm finding stationary points, then please say that. Like, actually tell me what you're doing. For stationary points, the derivative is zero. Okay, so now I can go and solve this. Looks like this. What would you like me to do? There's a bunch of different ways I could proceed with the working. I'm going to get this guy over here. And then I'm going to multiply and divide, just swap things around, get all the x's in one spot. So that's going to leave me with x cubed over here and a half over here. So this means that this is 1 on the cube root of 2, which I think you'll find is about 0.8. But go ahead, your calculator will tell you. Okay. So 0 0.8, 0 0.8, where is that in relation to this guy? What was the, what was the x value again for this? 1. That was 1, right? So actually my stationary point is just a little bit this way. So that's how I knew, actually, I'm going to pass through there, but the stationary point is actually a little bit earlier. Uh, 0.794 was what I worked out before. Okay, and your calculator can confirm that for you. Okay. So, does that make sense? Uh, when you can find out important features, you should. Uh, intercepts are obvious ones. Now, I think I'm almost done. Let's finish this off by adding some of those asymptotes that we kind of knew were there, but we, we didn't draw them in. Uh, where's the easy asymptote? It's a really obvious one. X equals zero, right? You can see that up down business. That's all good, okay? But then there's this other asymptotic behavior, which is kind of related to the parabola. Do you see that? So in fact, in reality, y equals x squared is an asymptote. Okay? Now that's a bit weird for us because as two unit and extension one students, we've only ever encountered straight lines that were asymptotes. But an asymptote is just a thing the curve approaches. And, and that's what it does, right? In fact, you could say, not only are you asymptotic to x equals zero, you can say you're asymptotic to the hyperbola if you wanted to. It's true. You, you approach both of those, do you see? Because they're all kind of squeezing in together. 